But first, the Prime Minister's pre-election claim that he represented safe change, well, that was always as fraudulent as Kevin Rudd's similar pre-election reassurance that he was a fiscal conservative. A number of people have described me as an economic conservative. When it comes to public finance, it's a badge I wear with pride. Just like Kevin Rudd turned out to be the most fiscally reckless Prime Minister since Gough Whitlam, well, there's no institution that's safe from Anthony Albanese's reckless ideological war. Thanks only because the Australian people got a vote, were we able to stop Albanese creating a third Indigenous chamber of the parliament and lock it all into our constitution. But on almost every other front, this Labor government is not about you and our national interest. It's about radically altering our institutions to suit the left. It's about rewarding the Labor Party and Labor mates. Mates like the union movement and industry super funds. And he's helped by a Liberal Party that often doesn't get it. That underestimates how far the Labor project to march through our institutions has already progressed. A Liberal Party that doesn't really understand that it's up against a ruthless cultural as well as economic enemy. A Liberal Party too that too often rolls over to Labor's changes. Then there's the so-called Teals and other crossbenchers, most of them Greens in disguise, who campaigned on integrity and politics but have backed in nearly all of Labor's broken promises. Look at those tax changes designed to punish incentive and to play the class war card waived through the parliament by the Teals, despite being a total breach of faith with Labor's pre-election pledges. Look at the latest workplace relations changes, waved through the parliament by a Senate crossbench, not because the PM and Minister Tony Burke were brilliant negotiators, but because David Pocock is more left-wing than Labor. I mean, honestly, this so-called right to disconnect Show me a Labor MP who doesn't call or text their staff out of hours or on the weekend and I'll show you someone who's not serious about the job. Now, to be fair, most businesses are not the same as politicians. Most businesses don't contact their staff out of hours unless they really have to. So this isn't a problem that needed a fix in the first place. This was a way just to give the unions a win and small business yet again another whack with more red tape and compliance that's already sending so many of them bust. It is all of a piece with a federal Labor government that's dead set on remaking everything in its own leftist image. So far, it's reworked the Productivity Commission with a new charter and a new head, a new lefty activist, with, for the first time in the PC's history, a commitment to identity economics. Now, God help us on that. It's reworked the Reserve Bank, a new charter there, a new head, and a reorientation of the bank away from some of its core business. It's reworked the Future Fund, with the former Labor Cabinet Minister, Greg Combay, now in charge, who believes in seeking our retirement money into Labor's green left social investments. Now, in today's Australian newspaper, I wrote about how Labor operatives are in charge of the lion's share of our super savings and are using that leverage to turn capitalists into socialists. That's the $1.3 trillion of our money that Labor makes us hand over to super funds largely run by retired Labor MPs. As an example, look at CBUS, the construction industry super fund chaired by former Labor Treasurer Wayne Swan that's happy to put $500 million into the government's social housing fund designed to create a pool of Labor voting lifelong renters. But like all the other union funds, CBUS screamed blue murder when the Liberal Party at the last election promised to allow people to access their own money, their own super, to help them buy their first home. A good move, it's their money after all, but this was a policy move that sent Labor and the unions out of their tree. Why? because letting people control their own superannuation would water down the power that the left gets from our money. Now, this is important because this is where a serious Liberal Party could start to unwind woke capitalism. 
get big business to act like business again, stop our savings being used for Labor's political purposes and help more young people into the housing market where they'll have, if they own a home, more of a stake in our country's future. A renewed Liberal promise to allow young people to use some or all of their compulsory super towards the purchase of their first home would once again enrage Labor while putting the Libs firmly on the side of aspiration and young voters who want to get ahead. But there's no point with big, iconic policies releasing them at the last minute like Scott Morrison did at the last election. Now, in that case, he did so because he was scared of a union backlash. I tell you what, I'd invite the backlash. Have the fight. These policies have got to be released early so people can become familiar with them. And in the process, understand that Labor wants people to be renters while the coalition wants them to own their home. Now, this, to me, as a campaigner, it's a no-brainer. A policy that reduces the left's stranglehold over big business, it sharpens that contrast between the Liberals and Labor, and I tell you all the time, no, no, that's how you win elections, and it helps young people to get the deposit they need to get into their first home. Now, what could be better for Peter Dutton? The opposition leader had a good 2023 because he opposed the voice before it was popular to do so. And he'll have a good 2024 if he stays brave and tells us what he's for as well as what he's against.